Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to another episode of our podcast. Today, we are excited to have Dr. Mohammed Ghilan join us once again. Most people found our uh, anti vax podcast very beneficial. Um, but Dr. Ghilan is back for another one, hopefully on a less controversial topic, um, on the topic of prophetic medicine. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Mohammed Ghilan. Barakallahu <clears> feekum. <throat> so, Today we have a we have a very interesting topic which has been recommended by many of our viewers. It's a topic which Muslims today and I think historically have had a fascination about, which is prophetic medicine. Um, and before we even jump into you know topics such as hijama, fasting, and prophetic what a, what a prophetic diet looks like, um, if we even get there, the the first question that needs to be asked is what do we mean by prophetic medicine? Is this something that even exists? Um, and maybe get some historical development as to how the term emerged because without, hist without history, we're not able to understand how we even got here. So the first question, Dr. Rilan, just as a starting point, um, do you mind explaining the historical backdrop as to how this concept or term such as prophetic medicine even came about and if there's really any validity to it? الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وانعم على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين my voice might be a little bit uh, strained because i just uh, spent uh, a good couple of hours just talking <laughs> prior to this so um, anyways in terms of prophetic medicine there is the current uh, impression or kind of conception of what prophetic medicine is and if you just look at the nominal muslim when they think about the tibb nabawi they think about oftentimes the most common book that I've seen is Ibn al-Qayyim al-Jawziya's uh, Tibb al-Nabawi in English translations or in Arabic. That is, you know, it's a staple in, in many uh, bookshelves. Um, but there are many other scholars who have written about this, Suyuti and others. Um, but from a, And what they think about is they think about it's kind of an amalgamation of lifestyle habits as well as potentially some remedies for minor kind of ailments that might afflict one. Um, and so they say, do this or don't do that, or eat this or don't don't eat that. And then they think about like specific things like al-habbas of that, the black seed, for example, or things mm -hmm. of that nature. Um, so that's how they think about it today. It's it, there's a medical kind of impression of it in terms of healthcare that the average Muslim might think about when they think about prophetic medicine. And, and, and but people yeah. also so also think it's like holistic. Is that it's 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 you know you have Western medicine and then you have prophetic mm -hmm. medicine. Yeah, so it's which I understand the sentiment. Uh, the sentiment is is definitely, a, and I share it, you know, in, in the sense of holistic. Because when you go see a doctor, oftentimes it's uh, you're reduced to a single symptom, and then they just give you a, some medication for it if if it's indicated, and then off you go. And before you know it, you're on four, five, six. I've seen patients with twenty plus tablets that they have to take, and is that really, you know, when when you know that once you get beyond four tablets, the adverse effects of the combination of the tablets are actually yeah. outweighing the benefits of whatever each individual tablet is giving you. So fair enough. Like it's, you want to think about it holistically. You want to think about the human body as an integrated whole. Um, and so the way that uh, this is built in, th in terms of prophetic medicine is this is the way to go. So that's in kind of a, a, a sentimental way. I understand it, but let's talk about the reality of what it actually is. Is there something called prophetic medicine? And if you look at the historical development of it all, um, his prophetic medicine, the term itself did not originate. It was an innovative term in about the fourth century after Hijra. So you have 300 plus odd years of scholarship, of hadith collections, of, com of commentaries, where nobody's thinking about a thing called prophetic medicine until it gets coined by scholars in the fourth century. Um, I wrote an article about this, uh, I translated rather, an article about this by Dr. Muhtaz al-Khatib. He's an associate professor at the Hamad bin Khalifa University in Qatar, wh where he talks about the conception and the origin of prophetic medicine. And he lists off, basically, he did he did the groundwork. So alhamdulillah, I didn't have to go back into the references to like trace all this. <laughs> he just did the groundwork and he just, he highlights like when did this originate, by which scholar. and And what he basically concludes is that the, uh, the area of prophetic medicine is not actually an area of medicine per se. Medicine is a term, is a technical term 
that the scholars of hadith who are collecting hadith transmissions, reports of the Prophet mm -hmm. they collected the reports under headings. And when it came okay. to practices in terms of health, um, eating, drinking, um, any oh, yeah. recommended treatments, um, yeah. also, also uh, spiritual kind of incantations, ruqya, um, uh, you know, treatment of magic, all of that. They basically combine all of that and they said, this, is, this falls under this chapter heading. Okay. But their intention was not to say, now you can go up and open up a clinic. And say mm -hmm. I am I'm doing this. This is just collecting these hadith transmissions. And the point that Dr. Mataza Khatib makes in the article is when you're dealing with hadith, you have to answer a number of questions. First of all, is this hadith authentic? Mm -hmm. Second of all, what are the indications? What's the dilala of this hadith? What, what is it pointing to? What's the meanings that you get from it? Uh, third of all, um, not all hadith that are authentic are acted upon. If you look into how fiqh you know, which is the application mm -hmm. of these things, just because a hadith is authentic does not mean that you have to act upon it. It has to fit within a greater body of usul that looks into how this hadith is applied. Mm -hmm. And then fourth of all, okay, you've reported a hadith, but now you have to answer the question of, is this actually part of revelation to sharia? Like this is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam giving us decree? Or is this just happens to be something of the cultural and, uh, and knowledge milieu of how ailments are treated. And this is what the, the Prophet was engaging in, uh, saying that there is no harm engaging in this or pointing out if there is benefit in something that there is benefit in and so you can engage in it. So you have to, there's a number of steps that you have to kind of address before you go into that. And the main thing that he notes um, that this might be controversial, even though you called it un not, not so much controversial, but... <laughs> Our brothers and sisters that are involved in an alternative kind of health sphere, they don't appreciate the influence of Greek uh, medicine onto what they call Islamic medicine. What's called medicine is oftentimes just kind of ideas from the Greeks that medieval period Muslim scholars and physicians picked up and they just there was benefit in it and so they just applied it because they saw something there. But that doesn't make it Islamic. It just means that this was an inheritance that they took on and they just applied it. And Dr. Khatib points out in the article that if you look at the books of prophetic medicine, he specifically points out Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyah's book because that was the first impression I got from it when I read it. I was like, subhanAllah, okay. he's, he's, he's putting all these hadiths in and the way that even the terminology that he uses to describe how the Prophet was eating, it's not native terminology to the Arab milieu of how they talked about things. It's actually terminology that was brought over from the Greeks. And he's uh, juxtaposing that or he's kind of using that to describe how the Prophet was doing things and then billing that as prophetic medicine. Now, Ibn Qayyim al as a muhaddith, he's going to look at that as tashri'ah, which is another thing that Dr. Khatib points out. He's like the muhaddithun, the hadith scholars, treat the corpus of hadith differently from the fiqh scholars. They, mm -hmm. Their impression of it is different. And so... When you look at this kind of complexity of how all of this comes together and you look at how medicine is practiced, even in early mm -hmm. Islam, the physicians were largely kind of acting as if it didn't exist, this body of prophetic medicine. This was specifically an, occu like a, an occupation of the hadith collectors that they collected mm -hmm. in hadith texts that didn't really have any application to the practice of medicine. Okay. Um, so, 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 so uh, when we're talking about Ibn al-Qayyim al jawzis book, Tib uh, al um when he's meant the hadith, so you're saying that there, there, there's, um, he's taking the, these, these, the influences, whether he realizes or not, from Greek medicine, but the hadiths that he's using are, are sound hadiths, correct? The hadiths are sound hadiths. I'm not disputing the hadiths themselves. Okay. And I'm not disputing that you can benefit from the hadiths and apply them in your life and, and take them as just general counsel and guidance in terms of... I mean, look, the beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you want to emulate anybody, it's the beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you want to take advice okay. from anybody, you take it from the beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. al Hawa. He does not speak from his own whims. So he's uh, when he's recommending something and he says, for example... Uh, this might be jumping ahead, but he says hijama, for example. This is a recommended practice, prophetic practice, mm -hmm. the hijama. Yeah. Okay. If he says it's beneficial, 
I don't really care how many RCTs, randomized controlled trials you bring to my face with like, oh, this shows and, and how many Cochrane meta-analyses you bring to me that this is not shown to be beneficial or whatever. I don't care. He saw Salem said it's beneficial. Then I'm going to take his word for it and I'm going to apply it in my life because he says that it's beneficial to engage in in whatever context that he saw Salem says that it's beneficial to engage in. Because he said that it's beneficial. Why do I say that? Am I dismissive of science when I do that? I'm not dismissive of science. The thing about the scientific trials and, and the way that they're conducted, you have to understand that you are, uh, you're doing the trial and the study to answer a question. And so your question, how you frame the question, you're going to get an answer to that question. So the okay. next question you ask yourself is, okay, how, did the Prophet ﷺ describe to you exactly, mechanistically, in what way this hijama is going to be beneficial to you? We don't have that exact specific explanation for it. And so whatever trial you, you try to conduct to show that it's beneficial, you formulated a particular question that may not actually be relevant to what the Prophet ﷺ was speaking about. That's mm -hmm. one aspect. So in a material dimension. In a metaphysical dimension, because the reality, the wujud of the Muslim is not just the sensory experience stuff. Mm -hmm. We don't believe in dualism in that way. And this is something that uh, now that we're covering in the, the book club, Sayyidina Qibar Attas, one of the major points that he drives home is that the worldview of Islam is not, to, is not something that is derived from sensory experience. It is one that is derived from revelation. And it includes the ghaib and the seen, the unseen and the seen mm -hmm. realm. Both realms. Both. And so okay. reality is much, it's more grand than what um, the, the materialist will want to give you. So if Yisra Salam says that you have this particular practice and this is beneficial for you, Bismillah, it's beneficial, we believe in it, and that's really all I need. I don't need scientific validation for it. Mm -hmm. I don't need anybody to come and show me trials for it. And if somebody presents me with uh, scientific evidence that says, well, it's not beneficial. My question to you is like, in what way is it not beneficial? What did you ask? What was your question that you asked that you got a null uh, result for to come to mm -hmm. me now and make a grandiose overarching umbrella claim to say that it's absolutely not beneficial? Your okay. trial is addressing one specific point, and that point may not actually have panned out in your trial. But my beloved, وسلم, he's talking oh, about something yeah. else. So that's this goes to the point of and this might be a tangent but like why the Maliki say for example that the dog's saliva is not impure mm -hmm. yeah the 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 point of it because the Shafi'i say it's impure the Hanafi say it's impure the Maliki say it's impure it's not it's pure and yeah. the, the reasoning for it is they said he saw Salam said if the dog goes into the bowl of one of yours it's six times and seventh with the with dirt I think is the number if I recall correctly Okay. So they said, we apply the hadith. We wash this bowl seven times and the seventh with, with dirt. But he وسلم, said a number, which to us means there is some significance to this that goes beyond purity and impurity. Because when you wash impurities, there is no specific number. If it's washed okay. off with the first wash, then it's washed off. It's pure now. But he وسلم, said specifically, do it this way. There is a ritual to washing a bowl that a dog comes into. What is the significance of this? The Maliki say Ta'abudi. Where like it's just for worship. He saw Sam said, do it this okay. way. We're gonna do it this okay. way. The hadith is authentic, but we're not gonna get into like, oh, is it it's not where it's like this is not evidence that it's impure. Exactly. You know so, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if if we tie this in back to the original question, which I think is is, is a tough question to answer, which is if if we have an authentic hadith explaining the virtues of hijama or something else um i know there's one instance there's this one moment of the sira where the prophet i mean maybe we will discuss that later but we have these hadiths which are authentic and then we have modern science which is saying you know modern phys physicians today who are saying these are unscientific what do we do in a position in, in that position well, just back to the same point I just made. If they're going to say it's unscientific, your methodology is reductive asking a specific question about a specific outcome that you have predetermined by which you've set up your trial to answer that question. So if Yisra Salam is talking about something else, then we have to address that. Um, and in terms of Yisra Salam talking about these things, he's talking about it as a general lifestyle habits. He's not okay. talking in terms of medical intervention and treatment. And the problem we have here is uh, we have people 
good intentions, but they're sorry to say they're just they're very simple in the way that they approach this. We have a, a lady who actually died in in Sydney. She was trying to treat COVID with the black seed. Okay. Muslim lady. Yeah, yeah. She was a convert. She was very kind of, you know, all about this. And she was promoting it. And she was saying it's the black seed. That's what's gonna, It's not the vaccinations. It's the black seed. Well, she ended up in ICU and died. And her husband is in the ICU right now. I'm not sure if he passed away or not. But that's, that's what the black seed uh, does for you. It's just so... The point is, it's, if he saw Salem is speaking in these general terms, that's the thing. Like this idea of, of trying to subjugate the tradition to scientific analysis, um, when the tradition oftentimes does not lend itself even to the possibility of scientific analysis because of the way these things are expressed. If you read a scientific article, they're very specific with the terms that they're using, and they want to basically relate a single idea. Meanwhile, you have in the hadith and in the tafsir all these different variants and meanings and, and interpretive dimensions that they can draw from these hadiths. Where is that coming from? That's because the way the language is used, it lends itself to that multiplicity, which is problematic for a scientist trying to do a scientific analysis on this, trying to pin it down um, and subjugate it to that. So okay. if you have these, if you come across these hadiths, the point we're trying to make here is. Uh, if you come across these hadiths, that is not to exclude um, medical treatment. And uh, if you want to apply them in just your general day-to-day -day life in terms of just regular healthy habits, like he saw someone was a semi-vegetarian in his diet. We know this. If you just look at his eating habits, he was semi-vegetarian. Mm -hmm. You know, he uh, the sunnah to fast, you know, Mondays and Thursdays and the three middle days of the month and then to fast most of Shaban and, most of, and then obviously all of Ramadan and then the six days after that for Shawwal. So... You know, you have and then Ashura, and so you have all these different fasts that are incorporated that can have material benefit, they can have health benefit, but their primary intention is not about health benefit, their primary intention is about uh spiritual benefit. Mm -hmm. okay. So we're not dualists, but I, I find it problematic personally when Muslims put so much focus on the material dimension of these things and basically validate the practices because they have health outcome benefits. So give me, give me, me give us an example. Incidental. Give us an huh? example. Give us a specific example. Fasting, for example. Oh, you know, like this, the, the whole craze now is the intermittent fasting and how you can lose weight and improve your blood uh, glucose levels and all of that. And look, you know, and, and the scientists discover that the best, and they'll give you papers, you know, citing, you know, three days of the month you should fast or like two days a week you should fast. And then Muslims will jump on that and go like, look, um, I just read an article actually just before this podcast by Dr. Mus uh, Sheikh Muzaffar Akbar. And um, he calls it uh, precursorism is the uh, infection. You know, you know, that article got shared to every I got I got I think five people messaged me the article today alone. The article is unbelievable because it's he points out exactly the problem. He's like uh -huh. just you know scientists come up with something and then it's like oh precursoritis like we've just yeah. oh we've discovered this before you. You've always known this. Yeah, yeah yeah and then you subject the beloved sallallahu and the tradition to scientific analysis and stuff when you know if you anybody that's in the scientific domain knows that everything is provisional. <laughs> This exactly. is what we know so far until further studies are done. And we know through the history of science that conclusions that have been, you know, you know, unequivocal, this is absolutely the most beneficial thing. 20 years later, they're like, oh, yeah, you know, it's so silly of us. We thought this was the most beneficial exactly. thing, but actually we changed our mind in this. That is not a way to conduct your religious practice. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Dr. Vilan, can you quickly summarize that article? Because I know, I know we've read it, but for others who haven't, can you explain what this idea of precursorism and how is it related to the subject? So Sheikh Muzaffar Iqbal, who's just a brilliant uh, scholar, he, he basically says that um, due to the gist of the article is because of our inferiority complex. Um, uh, and uh, what we do is we try to claim a precedence for everything that the Western kind of inventors and scientists have done. He brings up Ibn Khaldun's uh, commentary in the Muqaddimah where Ibn Khaldun says um, uh, that the, the the defeated will always try to emulate their their uh, oppressors and their, yeah. and their conquerors. Yeah. And so, but the problem is, and that's what Muzaffar Iqbal points this out, the problem is you can't really imitate science. You can't <laughs> imitate technology. 
right? You can't pretend like the, this is, you can't take it, you can't pretend that it's your own. So the solution that Muslims have found was to basically go back in history and say like, oh, and, and they'll do it even in, in areas where he says that it's religiously problematic. Oh, Darwin didn't come up with evolution. It was Biruni and Jahels. And so all of a sudden, we're atheists now. We're, we're, we're now atheists, and we came up with evolution. And he's like, and the big theory and the speed you know, of light is you know, in the Quran. You know, Dr. Ilan, uh, Vice wrote an article. Uh, I think it was a Muslim who wrote it, saying that Muslims created the theory of evolution. And I remember when I first read it, I think last year, I shared it everywhere. And I yeah. <laughs> stuck with a lot. I told just, everybody, Muslims created a theory of evolution. <laughs> it's just silly. Oh, it's like, or Abbas bin Fernas. Apparently, he did the flight thing. And then Leonardo da Vinci, like 400 years later, we now project, oh, and he knew Arabic. He definitely knew Arabic. And he read Abbas bin Fernas and he looked at the drawings and then he created this thing. And that's why we have planes now because Abbas bin Fernas jumped off a building with some makeshift wings and broke his back. Like, it's just like when you look at the whole thing, it's just ridiculous. And so, in the realm of meta, so that's that's the gist of the article is that we need to stop doing this. And he actually highlights, and I'm so happy that he did this. Uh, Maurice Bukai and Thomas Moore, like all these people that is like, oh, embryology in the Quran and and scientific, uh, scientific miracles. Miracles of the Quran and all of that. And he points out is like all these people basically have pulled out, dissociated themselves from it. Um, the whole thing is just a massive industry that has no basis. And um, the solution or the vaccination against pure, uh, precursorism is seeking knowledge. Uh, and there's no shortcuts for that. You have to study and you have to do your homework. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the article. And I highly encourage people to go and check that one out. Mm -hmm. So, but in the realm of medicine, what my impression is, I find that because, um, especially the, those in the traditional kind of side of things, we want to claim authenticity and identity and like we're different. You know, and we have our own way of knowing. And, and mm -hmm. it's kind of uh, ironically postmodernist uh, for the traditionalist Absolutely. side. Because it, 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 it claims that uh, there is no objectivity. It's like, oh, we, we have our own metaphysics and our metaphysics dictates that this is the way to achieve, to achieve health. And there'll be very, there's kind of an interesting hostility to empirical verification on the part of, of that crowd. And so they will try to come up with kind of a system of medical practice that is an amalgamation of what metaphysically are, they're not really like um, compa uh, compatible, but they'll say like, oh, Ay Ayurvedic medicine, Greek medicine. Um, and then they'll add a little bit of sprinkling on top of the prophetic medicine because prophetic medicine is just these isolated reports that don't lend themselves to creating an entire coherent body of mm -hmm medical practice so they'll just add that on top of these kind of pantheistic pagan kind of based systems from the east and then they will say this is now an islamic way of doing things and then they'll find isolated readings from uh you know muslim physicians which they will take out of context like ibn sina and, uh, and razi and and others they'll just read the, they'll take these quotes from them and they'll say this is how muslims practice medicine and all of that in the face of, well, we're combating scientism and we're combating atheism. And that's what modern mainstream medicine is really based okay. on. It's based on a materialistic kind of view of the human being. And the human being is much more than just a collection of organs that are functioning together. And to me, that's like when I say it's a postmodernist, I mean in the sense that when you point out like, okay, you want to practice homeopathy, there has not been a single verified report like a, a number of people have tried to uh, empirically verify the claims that you make about homeopathy in, in terms of its healing powers and all of that not a single study has actually panned out to show that this actually works what they've shown in fact was it looks like it has to do with the doctor patient relationship and, and and something there is happening between the doctor and the patient and the interaction itself that is making the patient, it's almost like an interesting version of a placebo effect that just mm. sit, sitting down with somebody who hears your story makes you feel better. Um, mm. interesting. But the actual material that you, that you work with and the treatments and the little solutions and concoctions that you're making, which are diluted to nothing, those things, nobody has been able to verify. Like it's a, and, but they will be hostile to that. And I'll say, no, no, uh, your methodology is not taking into account the spiritual dimension of this and that. It's like, okay. Now you're talking metaphysics. You're okay. talking about which mm -hmm. you now have to prove to me from the Quran and the Sunnah that the Prophet ﷺ engaged in this practice. 
and which that particular okay. aspect, no evidence. There is no evidence in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet doing anything close to what homeopathy is. But then you'll have these Muslims kind of engaging in this and incorporating it into their practice and calling it Islamic and prophetic, and it muddies the waters and creates okay. confusion. So uh, two things. One, you know, so the point that you mentioned is that prophetic medicine is really just a set of isolated sayings or actions of the Prophet ﷺ, which are brought to, which people have kind of brought together and turned it into like a whole paradigm that this is a whole science, when in reality it's just a series of uh, reports. Is that correct? It's a series of reports that was con the concern mostly of Hadith scholars that historically was not even paid attention to by Muslim physicians even during the so-called golden age of Islam. So with people like, like with Ibn Sina's uh, his Qanun or Razi, with them, they, they weren't really, they were, these are people who made remarkable contributions in the realm of medicine. And you're saying that they weren't, they, they weren't big advocates of this. They weren't mentioning this idea of pro prophetic medicine. They or did not talk about it. What they did was they inherited whatever medical practices were present at the time, mostly from the Greeks or the translations. And they built upon it. And they refuted some of the ideas of the Greeks because their empirical observations did not match whatever the Greek author that they were reading, most a lot of times Galen uh, or Hippocrates. They would read what they said and they would observe and say, oh, this doesn't match. And as great of a physician as Galen was, our empirical observation is much more powerful and much more trustworthy than what he said. So we'll just go with the empirical observation. And so they just built on that and went with it. And Arazi, if you want to talk about random mass control trials, he ran a hospital in Baghdad that was quite large. And he would do things in terms of bloodletting and all of that. He would apply the, the empirical method. It was just like, does this work? Let me divide the patients up and see if it does work. So it was strictly an, an experimental trial and error. Let's see if this works. Uh, inheritance. That's medicine. That's how medicine has yeah. been working. Yeah. Okay. And so, so what do you think of this idea that certain Muslims um, have this romanticization of prophetic medicine, as if this is all, you know? And obviously, there, there there's a number of virtues in in the you know what the we affirm you know what the Prophet ﷺ says when it comes to honey, black seed, hijab, and, and these things things that are in the authentic reports, but this idea of completely turning towards alternative medicine completely turning to you know you know i've met many people who've said black seed will solve all of your problems as long as you're as long as you have black seed you have your olive oil you don't need to go to the doctor at all <laughs> <laughs> i mean again uh, it, this goes back to the uh your normal kind of day-to-day -day life healthy habits of of practice that you do versus treatment for something. I mean, the beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is even asking in, the, in an authentic report, he's asking companions, which one of you is more skilled in medicine? Mm -hmm. So, and the companions are like, what? Uh, you're asking which one of us is more skilled in medicine? Like it's, so he saw Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is seeking expertise in this, in this realm. He's not saying I'm the prophet, I get wahi, this is what, so he gives you these kind of general recommendations that, you know, take honey and take the black seed and it's like it's benefit in all of these things. But that's not him prescribing for you a treatment protocol if you do get sick. If you do get sick, you need to go see someone who's been trained in medicine to treat mm -hmm. you. Um, exactly. And, that's and, you know, it's it's interesting. You know, we talk about uh, Tibba Nabawi, prophetic medicine. There's actually uh, Imam al wrote uh, a book with the same title. And, yeah. uh, the, you know, Aisha radiallahu anha was once asked how she had so much knowledge of medicine. And she responded, I used to listen to the Prophet Sallallahu discussions with uh, physicians. And yes. So, so I think, you know, it's, so it's a beautiful... actually another point that a lot of, this wasn't mentioned in uh, uh, Dr. Khatib's article, but a lot of the body that is popularized as prophetic medicine, when you trace back the reports, the, uh, the hadiths of the Bilal Sallallahu Alaihi are very few when it comes to this. But you still have the significant body of work that's called body of prophetic medicine. Where is that from? Most of it actually goes back to Aisha radiallahu anha. Okay. And she, like you said, she listened to the Prophet and talking to the physicians. And the physician, and so she picked that up from them because she was interested in medicine. So mm -hmm. you you gotta take all that. I mean, the, this subject is confronting for a lot of Muslims who really put their kind of 
stock into this because they they feel like this is so, like a and i think it has to do with the crisis of identity like searching for identity. ever since we've been colonized and our education was kind of uh fractured and where sacred knowledge is sup something separate from material knowledge and secular knowledge and then you have the uh, loss of our own political self-determination no, no khilafa no khalif uh, no khalifa and all of that so now we're just kind of searching for identity all of these things and so you find muslims unfortunately gravitating towards ideas that when you really investigate it you're like okay this historically does not add up to what you're saying it should add up to or you know but i i think another reason also is that we see islam as an entire world view right that islam impacts yes. every aspect of one's life so whether that's in seeking knowledge whether that's in one's daily routines you know islam is a set of we have a set of laws Islam has, you know, all these various things. So why wouldn't Islam have something to say for medicine? Um, and I believe, it, it you know, would, yeah, right? it would say it. For example, la darara wa la darar. There is no harm and there is no reciproc reciprocating harm as a general principle. Um, you have the scholars talking. Most of the early discussions, and this is at the beginning of the art uh, of the article by Dr. Khatib. Most of the early discussions on medicine were not even on medicine. Most of the early discussions on medicine by the scholars were about permissibility to seek treatment. You and that, that 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 was that, that was an interesting point in the article. Do you mind uh, explaining what what the scholars' uh, views were on you know seeking medicine? So, the Shafi'is, and that's uh, that's the interesting thing. If there is prophetic medicine, then you'll have to tell people you're obligated to actually seek it out and 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 apply it. But the Shafi'is, by and large, said it's there is no obligation to seek treatment. You can get sick and just suffer quietly through it until you die. And and the reason for that is because they said there is no guarantee that the treatment that you're applying will actually work. Now, riddle me this. The Shafi'is are all saying there's no guarantee for this particular thing to work. And yet they know a hadith that talks about the black seed that is a cure from every illness. So how can they make such a bold claim negating what the hadith is saying? They knew the hadith. So... This tells you something about the the validity of this whole enterprise, that there is something called prophetic medicine to apply. Mm -hmm. I, I need to just kind of um, uh, qualify all of this by saying that I know there are scholars that say there is such a thing as prophetic medicine. So I'm not saying that uh, I'm making kind of a an absolutist claim that this thing does not exist. You will find scholars that will talk about it. What I'm saying is that when you trace the history, of the development of this and who specifically what background these scholars had who involved themselves in this particular arena and where was it mentioned and what applicability did it have to the normal day-to-day -day life of a believer you will not find what we find today amongst muslims nowadays and the way that they approach prophetic medicine mm -hmm. and I, I think that's an excellent point for even me uh, me to mention my own views um you know i think uh, undoubtedly when and we're, we're going to get to some of these things, inshallah, later. But I do believe that it's, it, you know, Islam is a cure for both the soul and the body. And within certain, an example we'll get to, for example, is the Quran, right? Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, mm -hmm. That the Quran is, you know, it, it, it is a cure for the believers. And it, it's very interesting. We know, we know the spiritual benefits one gets from reading Quran. But there's also a lot of physical benefits as well. Um, Dr. Malik Badri, the founder of Islamic psychology, wrote his book called Contemplation, an Islamic psycho-spiritual uh, something. But he, he talks about how in psychology now they're creating this new school called Quran therapy, where they, they, put, they put people in a room, they put earphones in, they make them listen to Quran, and they make them close their eyes, and they see the changes in their body. Um, it's just, so this is just, this is just one example, but... I mean, you know, I'll tell you, I do this. I, I like, I, I love the fact that Sheikh Hamza put a podcast about this, um, uh, not too long ago about yeah. the benefits of the Quran. And he talks about some of his teachers, may Allah bless them, uh, and have mercy upon them. They had, um, like their arteries and they do their heart, their blood work and stuff. And it's like, they're elderly, but their, their, their physiology is of that of a 30 year old. Um, and, and he, it's attributed to the Quran. I personally, listen to the Quran with one of the intentions that I listen to the Quran with is to make sure that I don't have atherosclerosis. What, what is that disease? It's the buildup of plaque in your arteries. So I mm. listen to the Quran with the intention of lowering my blood pressure, with the intention of improving my cardiovascular health. That's one of the intentions that I have when I listen to the Quran. So mm. 
Yeah, I, I'm totally with you. I'm glad you mentioned this example. It's it, it's it's something that when I was when I was in my last semester doing my undergraduate degree and I was in final season and I had you know all this stress, is I would put the phone away. You know, I, I'm enough. I'd put the computer away and I'd have my earphones and I'd be in a dark room um, and just listening to the Quran and it, it it brought me into a state of sakina you know, a state of peace. And it was at that moment that I realized that this, this Shifa is both a physical and also a spiritual one. Agreed. So, so, so when we talk about prophetic medicine, I'm not sure if prophetic medicine or Islamic medicine, but there is some sort of spiritual benefit that, that, that Islam, that the Prophet ﷺ brought with him. Correct? Absolutely. This is absolutely, there's no doubt in that. If you live the way the Prophet ﷺ lived, you will live a healthy life. Mm -hmm. um, there's no doubt about that because he's an insan al kamil he's mm -hmm. the complete human being he's the perfect balance between the spiritual and the material his life is the life that you want to emulate and so mm -hmm. if you want to talk about like in a general kind of um, umbrella term prophetic medicine in terms of like uh, primary care preventative health uh, practices he's your example mm -hmm. he's what you want to follow but the second you have an ailment of some sort I think what you need is um, someone who's trained in the field of medical practice, um, who who is uh, concerned about empirical verification of claims, who is not going to attribute everything to um, some unseen forces um, that are really the way that uh, in the alternative uh, medicine crowd, and I know they get upset with me when I say this, but the metaphysics of alternative health practices, whether it's Chinese medicine or Greek medicine or Ayurvedic medicine or whatever, the metaphysics of it is, is opposed to the Islamic metaphysics. And they make a lot of claims about unseen forces and things that you just can't, when, you, when, you, when they can't verify their claims empirically, they always go to this dimension and then they start talking about spirituality and such, which from a Muslim standpoint, this is an ahistorical way to deal with this. And our Muslim physician predecessors, that's not how they did medicine. Mm -hmm. They were really, they cared about facts and they cared about empirically verifying claims. Okay. So, you know, one of, one of the interesting things that Ibn al-Qayyim mentions in his uh, Tibb al-Nabawi, Prophetic Medicine, is that he said regarding this whole idea of prophetic medicine, he said, you will benefit from this to the degree in which you actually believe in the Prophet Sallallahu um, meaning, you know, it's, it's almost like the placebo effect. Do you mind commenting on that? That's an interesting statement for him to make because he also makes a statement that is absolutely true and is from Mishkat and Nubuwa and it's Wahi. And, uh, okay, either it is absolutely going to work or it is not going to work. Like if I inject you right now with propofol, I will sedate you. I don't care what you believe. I don't care if you're an atheist, a believer, whatever. If I give you some propofol, you're going to go to sleep. This is how we sedate people in the ED. So, like, it's it, it, it's the same thing with this, if it's to the degree that you believe in it. To me, that sounds a lot like homeopathy and, like, you know, this kind of alternative but crowd. But I, I think, I, I think what, what he, perhaps what he was trying to get at is that, look, it works, but if you have a really strong yaqeen and conviction in it, it'll be even stronger. Yeah, uh, that leaves room for subjectivities to enter into the domain of verifying the claims of the beloved sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Oh, okay. um, and to me, that statement, um, you know, may Allah bless Ibn al al Jawziya, but that statement to me is problematic because now it opens the door for spiritual doubts on somebody who may not benefit from this. And then they start to doubt their own Islam because like, oh, I did this and the Prophet said that and it didn't work and whatever. I, I I don't like that statement. Um, I think I, it's I, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure if this was central, but it, 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 I did come across it. Um, but there's an, there's another interesting thing I, I really wanted to get your perspective on. It's what Ibn Khaldun said. Ibn Khaldun said that the Prophet wasallam brought the principles of medicine. And one of the ayats he cites as his proof is, Kulu ashrabu wa la tusrifu. Hmm. that eat and drink but not in excess because God doesn't like the transgressors and so this takes us to another way of the, a different road which is the, the, the Prophet brought the principles right the, the, the not the specifics but just the idea of not eating uh, or e eating too much like you mentioned that the Prophet was a semi-vegetarian right hmm. yeah so that now goes down to the realm of preventative health 
So in terms of uh, preventing disease and, and illness and all of that stuff, absolutely. We have the principles for it. Um, uh, the sunnah of the Bilal and how and, and how he practiced, that's the way that you would want to practice. And um, interestingly, even in the way that he practiced, sometimes there were exceptions to that rule where he said, don't do what I'm doing because I'm with my Lord. He feeds me and he gives me drink. Mm -hmm. um, and so, for example, we were pro prohibited from fasting. We saw it. So continually fasting day and night, day and night, day and night without breaking it. You have to break your fast at Maghrib time. And the Sahaba asked the Prophet ﷺ about his practice because he wasn't breaking his fast. He would just continue. And he said, I'm not like you. Hmm. There's a difference there. So that's another aspect. That's another dimension where you have to kind of take into account. Not everything the Prophet ﷺ did is applicable to you and how you live. You need to also ask that question. Was this specific to him as a prophet? Or was this also instructive to us to practice as followers of the Prophet ﷺ? Okay. So now, now if we if we get into the specifics, right? This is what everybody is very. Some people are interested in just you know the concept of prophetic medicine, but most of the questions, most of the feedback I got back were of the specifics. So, for example, I think you know uh, one of the biggest ones I got was hijama. Mm. Um, we have we have many hadiths about hijama, the virtues of it. Um, is this something? And, and we so f first, uh, I think I want uh, first question I want to ask is what is the scientific literature? say about hijama it's actually um uh not a settled issue so there's studies that support studies that don't support um you'll talk to most mainstream scientists about it, or physicians about it and they'll say overall it's not something that has been shown to be beneficial in the con i gotta go back to this point in the context in which these things are being studied for the specific question that is being asked of of them is this going to treat your ailment of x so let's say you come in with the flu and then you mm -hmm. say like, will hijama benefit me? Will it make my flu period shorter? This is just kind of a hypothetical example. Yeah. And then you do, you do hijama and then you find actually it didn't. It might have made it worse. Now, do you go back and say that hijama is harmful? Absolutely. As an absolute thing. Or is this something that the Prophet was speaking about in terms of a specific context? So when you okay. look at scientific studies and you ask, like, what does the science say and the medical literature say? And I tell you, overall, they have not shown the purported benefits. Like, uh, this was a big deal, by the way, when Michael Phelps at the Olympics, because they saw the cups. Yeah. Signs back. And so this was a big rage at the time. A lot of articles written about it. And overall, if you look to if you look to the physicians and scientific community, they'll say, like, there's no evidence to suggest that it's helpful. But Michael Phelps thought it was helpful. Uh, for whatever mm -hmm. reason. Um, and so the questions that you're asked, and this is a point that, um, you know, we need to be very clear about and very specific. Scientific questions are very specific questions, and the studies are designed to answer that particular question. But it mm -hmm. does not reflect on the entirety of what the hadith is speaking about. And you cannot use it to say um, that um, whatever the Prophet ﷺ said then is not substantiated. Okay. Because... Uh, so, uh, the they, there are, you know, like Antonio Brown, right? He was yeah. the greatest wide receiver in the NFL. He cupping was something he he did quite frequently, um, sure. and I believe I, I believe I, I might have seen LeBron James also do it. But yeah, the reason the, the the reason I'm mentioning this is because you have certain Muslims who will look into some of these practices. They'll say that the Prophet Sallam ex extolled the virtues of it. They'll read the scientific literature, and then they'll have somewhat of almost like a crisis of Iman or a complete neglect of the scientific literature. Yeah, I'm telling you personally, because I've done cupping, I have no doubts about the Prophet ﷺ and the benefit of it. Even if, like I said uh, before we start recording, maybe, you bring me all the scientific studies you want about this. I don't care. You know, he saw Salam extolled the virtues of it. I do these things in the way that the Malikis talk about dog saliva. Okay. You know, like, he's also said, clean your bowl seven times, the seventh with dirt. I do it to out of worship, you know. But then when it comes to actual, I'm not going to take hijama and then combine it with whatever ailment and say, like, someone comes to me in the clinic and says, uh, let's say they have diverticulosis. They have diverticulitis, even, okay. right? Which is an outpouching of a sac in the bowels and it gets infected. And the treatment for that, if you want to go conservative, is antibiotics. 
or if it starts to rupture, they might actually have to go in for surgery. I'm not going to go sit there and go to the guy, listen, you need some hijama because okay. the process told the, the virtues of hijama. And so that's what you need to do in order for you to improve. You can incorporate these things uh, from the process into your life and into whatever treatments that you're undergoing for whatever thing, um, believing in them. But to turn that entire body and say, there is an alternative mode of doing medicine that is to be taken in, a, in, in opposition to whatever treatments that you can have because yeah. you believe that's where the problem is. Okay. Okay. As, as a physician, would you recommend, as a physician speaking to a Muslim audience um, that is thinking about hijama, would you, are you able to make, you know, would you make a general comment saying that it's, it's rec I'd recommend you do it or would you just kind of, Depends on each I person. Do, I would do the cop out of physicians that have uh, that have it, which is you need to talk to your physician because I don't know what kind of underlying conditions you might have. Um, so I can't make a general recommendation to uh, people to take and then assume that it's specific to them. If you have some sort of a blood disorder, of clotting disorder, if you have whatever, I mean, we need to know. I need to know your history before I can go and say, all right, you can go ahead and practice this thing. Um, okay. You know, if you're allergic to honey. And it gives you anaphylactic shock. You're not going to come to me and say, "Oh, can you give a recommendation to this?" You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah, a patient yeah. comes to me as allergic to honey. I'll say, "Stay away from honey." I know the Prophet I said, said it's got all these virtues and these benefits, uh -huh. but you are allergic to this thing and it's going to kill you. Okay. <laughs> that doesn't make the Prophet I said statement false. It just means that you have a particular context for you that excludes you from this practice. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're saying don't just take, you know, don't take these hadiths that talk about, you know, the virtues of things like olive oil, honey, hijama. Don't generally apply it to yourself specifically unless you've had, you know, a physician's approval. I would say some of these things are benign, like olive oil and things like that. These are benign. But you know your body, you know your conditions, you know what's underlying. And if you're wanting to engage in some practice, and I love the example that Sheikh Hamza Yusuf <laughs> used before. Um, he said that, uh, I can't remember the lines of the poetry now, but uh, um, oh my God, I forgot it. The translation of it is something like the the deluded one thinks that books will guide. Did this person not hear about Tum al-Hakim, the, the physician, the, the wise man Tuma, who pretended to be a physician. And um, he basically got killed with a black snake and it's because he read in the book Al Habba Sauda, but it was a typo, and it says Al Hayya Sauda, the black snake said Al Habba. And so he took us. So that's kind of the example I tell people. You know, you can come across these hadiths, but you need to have a professional guide you uh, in this particular thing. And if you have a condition, I would say you need to talk to somebody, and I cannot emphasize this enough. You need to talk to someone who cares about empirical verification of their claims subjective kind of feelings and anecdotal accounts i saw somebody whose cousin had this and they said this and that this kind of business this is how people die uh, and not to be extreme about it but like it's just uh, this can this is where it can lead to you need to talk to someone who cares about facts who cares about empirical verification who cares about vetting information okay. you know and that's that's what you talk to and then okay if it's something that you can find benefit in you can go ahead and do it so, for example, if, if, if I were to go to my local physician and tell him that I'm interested in, in getting hijama done and he responds by saying, you know, there's nothing that's showing up. There's, there's nothing to be concerned about um, in terms of your specific health. But, you know, just personally, you know, I think it's unscientific. You're saying it. Well, saying that's, that's, that's now the physician applying their own ideology and they're not a believer or whatever the case may be. Look, that's your opinion. You can okay. keep it to yourself. Okay. This is a, that's what I would say to the physician flat out. I was like, that's, you know, I'm a little bit more combative than, <laughs> so a little more gentle. We I was know. like, that's, you know, uh, know. But for me, it's like, you can, I asked you a specific question. I don't need your ad lib kind of like suggestions about, do I have anything that excludes me from engaging in this practice? Is this going to harm me in any way? If it's not, then all right, Bismillah, I'm going to go in. I don't have a blood clotting disorder. I don't have any issues that might cause me problems. Then I'm going to go ahead and do this. Okay. Um, and that's basically what I would tell people that you don't need to be shy about these authentic reports of the beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam telling you there's benefit in these things and incorporating them into your overall, overall health regime. 
-hmm. There's no okay. need to be shy about that. And there's no rejection of any of that. You can apply them. I'm making a very specific point, which is in terms of medical interventions for um, uh, uh, acute problems that happen, then you need to have somebody who's actually trained medically to guide you through this. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, you know, I, I, I love what the conclusion is. The conclusion it seems is that if your doctor has, you know, if your physician has analyzed you, he's seen that this will not harm you in any way, then Bismillah, go ahead. But yeah. for some people, if you have some underlying symptoms or some diseases or some harms, then, you know, it's probably best to stay away. But that the generality of the message, you know, the, 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 the effectiveness of hijama is not disputed on a general level, right? That's something we no, affirm. I, absolutely not. No. The Prophet ﷺ said it's beneficial. It's beneficial. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I just don't want in the mix of it, some people get confused and think. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. He said it's beneficial. It's beneficial. Bismillah. Um, and so what, what about things like olive oil and honey? Are these just, we should just be applying them into our lifestyle? There are virtues to them. The Prophet ﷺ encourages them. Now you have scientific evidence that says there's benefit to all of these things. Once again, do I need the scientific evidence to show that they're benefit? No, I don't. The Prophet ﷺ said they're beneficial. I'll, I'll apply them. I'll include them into my diet. Um, and Bismillah, go for it. Um, if the scientific community catches up to me afterwards and says, oh, yeah, by the way, that thing I've been doing, uh -huh. you know, I was like, Alhamdulillah, you know, the Prophet ﷺ said, that's nice. To me, it's like, to me, the scientific evidence supporting these practices is kind of in, incidental it's like mm -hmm. it doesn't increase my faith in it in any way okay. and at the same time if they come and say there is no benefit it doesn't really shake me in any way I'm not, like you guys has, you did a study that is has a gazillion limitations to it and then you're coming at me with an absolutist claim about it mm -hmm. that's not what i'm interested in you know it's especially and you know i i mentioned this in our last podcast but what what COVID has really done is it's explained to people how the scientific method works mm. and how things are going to change. You know, the study will come out even like, you know, Omicron is saying now, okay, you only have to quarantine. Like I, I was speaking to the CDC and I said, how long do I have to quarantine? And they said, oh, five days you have to quarantine. But after the next five days, you have to wear a mask. And I'm like, has, have the studies shown that you can pass on the disease in the next five days? And she said, we don't have anything like it, but you know, things are changing, you know, the regulations are changing as well. So just, just wear the mask. <laughs> I mean, it's just, yeah, that, this whole debacle of COVID, man, it's, it's the, I think the issue is, and I, uh, the reason I've been writing and publishing more things about the subject is because the, the, the mess that COVID has done, I just find myself having to, uh, of seeing like an uptick of Muslims adopting these practices because they're now getting mixed messages from the medical community. And unfortunately, there is a conflation between advocacy and public policy and the science. And you don't know who you're talking to anymore and who's given the guidance. And a lot of times recommendations are not even based on anything that's solid. Um, there's a lot of catastrophizing in terms of um, how people think in, in like, what is the worst outcome scenario? And let's plan based on that. Um, exactly. which is just to me is kind of um, it really exacerbates this problem so i just wanted to make sure that you know if i for me when i'm getting uh, hyped up about a subject and i start to write about it more often is because i'm seeing something happening in the community and ideas that are spreading that i think are problematic if this was simply an issue of people just kind of adopting things that are not going to have much of an impact or much of an, uh, a consequence to it, if they were inconsequential, I would have just let it go. Like, you know, Bismillah, let people do whatever they want to do. But now that I see people using this term of prophetic medicine to refuse um, immunizations and to engage in dangerous practices that have now claimed lives, and when I see Muslims that are starting to adopt conspiratorial kind of medical theory kind of stuff from the alternative health crowd, which is also adopting by in, in turn, you will also be adopting the metaphysics of the alternative medicine type of ideologies there. Okay. Now we have to address this and we have to talk about it and be very frank and clear about what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And if I, in my estimation view, there is something deeply problematic with it. And at subhanAllah, I, you know, it's one of those things that it gets confirmed for me when I I went back to revisit the pro, uh, the prolegomena uh, and Atas's work to to go through for under his book club, and it was just like 
I saw my underlining. I read this book years ago, and I saw my underlining and some of the things. He's his concern with language, mm -hmm. and his concern with terminologies that Muslims kind of just and concepts that Muslims will translate into Islamic languages without deep thought, which in turn will incorporate ideas that may be alien to the Islamic tradition or even at times antithetical to it. And that will just create confusion. And that's mm -hmm. my concern. I care about this uh, deeply. And that's why I, I find myself to push uh, on this issue. And, you, you know, for me, it's very disheartening to hear stories such as you mentioned, this Muslim woman who in COVID decided that that this alternative medicine was going to protect her and she completely disregarded, you know, vaccines or whatever. And ultimately she passed away because, you know, I, I you know, the point that I the, the reason why I really wanted to do this podcast is to affirm that there is some sort of medicine, some sort of lifestyle that the Prophet ﷺ brought with him. Um, things like hijama, which which have haq, you know, which have truth in it, they have validity in it. But that doesn't mean that necessarily we abandon, you know, allopathic medicine, and we just start, you know, to only focus on alternative medicine as if this will solve all of it, and just trying to, you know, find the bridge between the two. Yeah, the interesting thing is that you to use the term allopathic. The term allopathic was a derogatory term that was coined by Samuel Hahnemann, who is the founder of homeopathic medicine. Um, and it is based, used to basically disparage. Um, for me, I, there's no allopathic or there's just medicine. And medicine as a field developed over time um, from practices where legitimately, even during Hahnemann's time, there was a lot of harm being done in the name of medicine because they were doing things that were not backed by any experimentation. They were harming and killing people actively, not knowing that that's what they were doing. Um, okay, can you give an example of that? Like bloodletting, they would just keep like uh, not hijama style, like bloodletting, like literally just open, like venipuncture, like to get a, a okay. needle into your vein and just empty you out and thinking that that would benefit you. And so I think Abraham Lincoln died with bloodletting. Um, no, Abraham so Lincoln it, was shot. <laughs> yeah. So, no, who is it? There was another yeah. one. One Abraham of the U.S. Lincoln presidents. Okay. One of, yeah, yeah. Lincoln was shot. Who is it? There was another one. George Washington? I'm I think sure. George Washington, maybe. One of the early U.S. presidents <laughs> died from bloodletting. You can go and fact check me on that one. But that, that actually happened. And so the, the practices they were doing were quite medieval and, and aggressive. Okay. And so he wanted to come up with something gentle, okay. Hahnemann. Um, but for me, it's medical practice is something that has developed over time um, the, from the Muslim side of things. We inherited whatever the Greeks had, we, ad we adopted some things, we rejected some things, we cared about empirical verification of claims, and it continues to develop over time until the, uh, uh, you know, the late 19th, I think, century uh, it was, or early 20th century, when it finally became regulated. Mm, okay. And it was the regulation of medical education that really <laughs> the, the, the folks on the alternative side don't like. So regulation basically says that, okay, if you want to be a doctor, you now have to go through this education and this curriculum has to actually be vetted. And you can't okay. just make claims out of nothing. These claims have to be verified. And so mm -hmm. there is a rigor that's been introduced to medical education and the, and the graduating of doctors because now you're dealing with people's lives. And that matters. Exactly. exactly. So okay. like when, I, when, I, when I look at what I do, the things that I had, the check boxes that I had to check and the police record checks in Canada and Australia and and because I deal with vulnerable populations. So I, they have to make sure that this individual that's going to be going into the hospital is going to be trustworthy, honest, sincere, caring. Um, and we need to verify all of this about this person before we let him onto the population because, you, you know, you, you're going to I have the power with my pad to kill somebody. Exactly. So, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that, that matters. And so the regulation basically controlled all of that. Um, and so I think the alternative crowd just hasn't caught up. They, they're still, for me, and this, again, this is going to sound arrogant and really dismissive, but they're stuck in a bygone past with practices that some of them may have some benefit to it, which are actually part of mainstream medicine, believe it or not. And some of them have been shown that this does not work. And so we just don't apply it. 
They want to talk you about think, medicine. Do you think there's any truth in alternative medicine? There is truth to the fact that you cannot treat a person as just a single symptom, for example. You have to treat the person uh, in a holistic way, that there is an element of environmental impact to health. That, um, and this is all part of modern medicine. Postal codes determine health outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your, your living conditions, your hygienic conditions, um, what do you put into your body? What do you eat? Like there was a recent paper, for example, that came out, and this is mainstream medicine. People with inflammatory bowel disease have been shown to have more microplastics in their gut, which is causing this inflammation. And when mm -hmm. they interviewed them, they found that more of them actually eat from eat takeout and from plastic containers compared to oh, people. Wow. That, wow. So this is, so for me, I, I eliminated anything to do with plastic after I saw wow. that paper. So they will try to build this and say like, oh, this is only the alternative medicine crowd that thinks about these things. No, 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 no. This is mainstream research, mainstream medicine. Now, what you need is to, you need a doctor who is um, uh, more integrative in their approach, who will look into these things, who's interested, curious. But the issue is medicine is under a lot of strain. If you look into how many patients you have to see per day, yeah. patient care a quality of patient care goes down because I just have to make, I mean, I remember at one time I, I walked out to, to, in the clinic, I just looked at the waiting room. It was packed. This was for like a, a five hour clinic and it was packed with people. And I'm like, all right, we need to get going with this. And each patient gets five, 10 minutes. Tell me seriously, in five, 10 minutes, what are you going to find out? You're going to invariably focus on the symptom that brought them in and try to deal with that and get them going because you got a room full of people waiting for you. Mm -hmm. now, the and it seems like, you know, in, in Dr. Ghilani, maybe you can correct me, but sometimes it feels like the doctor's just there to get his numbers in. Like sometimes, Honestly, it's so sometimes I'll, be waiting, I'll be waiting for my doctor. I'll wait two hours and he'll come, he'll see me for like two minutes and he'll be gone. Yeah. yeah. It's because the reason for the wait is because of the volume, the number of people that are there. And man, it's, it's really straining on resources. And so, I see the attraction to alternative medicine is really about um, wanting more time. And so you find like the, the benefit of alternative medicine is people get to have more time with their doctor. They will sit for an hour with you yeah. and you'll pay for it. You know, yeah. it's, it's the, it's the arena of like the upper middle class who get to benefit from this because they, they will charge you an arm and a leg for it because they're not under insurance. And so there's a class of people that get attracted to this who are already, you know, well to do in some financial sense, they can benefit from this. And because the doctor patient relationship is not just about the medical intervention, there's also that human element of connecting and talking okay. back and forth. Um, and so they actually get to benefit from that. And so for me, if people want to go to alternative medical practitioners, go for it. And, you know, if you feel, if you found benefit from it, I don't fault you for that. Go for it, do what you want. Mm -hmm. The line that I draw is with public health policy. Um, okay. You know, for you as an individual, you want to go and do whatever you want to do, do it for yourself. Bismillah. If you're benefiting, benefiting. Even if it's placebo, I don't care. But when you come to public health policy and you're now issuing recommendations at a population level, now you got to back up what you're saying. And you need to have your feet put to the fire and verify the claims that you're making. And my, my contention is, and what I'm putting forth, is that the alternative medicine crowd does not have the data does not have the verification to back up what they're saying. They might benefit as individuals from it and Bismillah, go for it, but they cannot speak in terms of public health, um, especially in times of like a pandemic or something like that. But, and you know, w w when you speak about alternative medicine, you're not necessarily talking about, you know, these homegrown recipes that our parents have had from generations, you know, to get rid of a cold or a flu, right? I, I, I use them. My wife makes me one and it works. So <laughs> when I get a call, I tell my wife, I was like, please, can I, can I get the drink? <laughs> Make the drink. <laughs> so, so is that alternative medicine? It's, it's, I guess you could call it alternative medicine. That's why like, if it works, it works for the individual, but I'm not going to go out and, and, and um, Advertise tell it. someone who's getting COVID, uh, go ahead and take this drink. It will make you better. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the last thing I wanted to ask you just quickly is, you know, there's a lot of discussion on the meat and Islam. 
So you mentioned earlier that the Prophet ﷺ was a semi-vegetarian. Um, we have sayings attributed to uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab where he wouldn't allow meat two days in a row. Um, some people argue that this is because meat wasn't as widespread there. You know, they, in today's age, we have meat everywhere. Some people look at the scientific evidence and they'll say, you know, it's fine to consume as much meat as possible as long as it's clean, ethical, pure. But well, what are your thoughts generally on this topic of meat and eating too much? I think um, claims that they did not have enough are not really substantiated uh, by historical evidence. Claims that they were poor and that's why they didn't have access to it. Also not substantiated by the empirical evidence of how much wealth was actually in Medina with the Sahaba and some of them who were quite rich. Um, they just did not show it and flaunt it and floss it like uh, people do nowadays. Um, uh, so he saw Sallam had access to whatever he wanted. In fact, he was asked by Jibreel towards the end, do you want to live forever and have everything and be a king of the world or do you want to go back to your Lord? And he says, So he saw Sallam was not um, uh, limited in resources in that sense. His, uh, when he went hungry, Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, we did not go hungry out of uh, poverty. We never did. He saw Sallam always did it by choice. He chose not to overeat. He chose, I mean, that hadith about a third for food, a third for drink, and a third for air, that is the last half of the hadith. The Bilal actually begins by saying it's sufficient for the son of Adam and the daughter of Adam to have few morsels of food to keep their back straight. Hmm. They absolutely must take their fill. You really got to eat up. Then have a third. For food. The, the sunnah is few morsels. It's not a third and a third and a third. Mm -hmm, okay. A third, and a third and a third is if you are a gluttonous type of person who can't control yourself, then have a third for food and a third for drink and a third for air. Mm -hmm. That's that's what that's about. So, okay. so the way that the Prophet ate was absolutely deliberate. The fact that he would go for a long period of time with no smoke coming out of his house because they're not cooking meat, that was deliberate. Mm. And so you have to look at that and 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 wonder. You know, am I doing things? And now we know, I mean, subhanAllah, the, the evidence comes through to show you that the more meat that you eat and the more that you feel, take your fill, the more chronic disease that you have and the more higher your risk becomes for cancers and things like that. So, no, if you look into the biographies of the companions, which are available, you'll find that they were very wealthy, very well-to-do, had a lot of resources. They had a lot of sheep in Medina. And so they could have slaughtered every day if they wanted to. Hmm. Um, the Prophet ﷺ had access to all of these resources, but he deliberately, and Sayyidina Aisha, Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, we never went hungry because we, it's for a lack. So. Interesting. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's something that a lot of, uh, you know, I, I, I think about a lot. You know, we have this tayyab food, clean ethical food but how much is it how much should a person be eating and in most of our daily households you know we're having meat two if not three four times a day <laughs> oh you're just talking about the number it's like how many types of meat are you having in a single meal <laughs> you know exactly. you have your steak with prawns like you just add the whole thing together and yeah yeah no it's 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 definitely problematic the allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the quran that uh Halal and tayyibah. He's always linking the two. Halal and tayyibah. It's never just halal. It's never just the legal dimension. It's also the ethical dimension of eating. And so you have to wonder about the source of your food. And your food has an impact on your practice, on your psyche, on your spirituality, your presence in your prayer, your dhikr. All of that has an impact. So you have to ask yourself at the very beginning, is my source of income halal itself? And then the food that I'm getting, the, the meat even if you're going to eat meat, um, that meat, how was the animal treated prior to, to the sacrifice? You know, what am I putting into my body? Is, is this abuse that I'm taking in? I mean, people wonder, like, why am I so anxious or why do I have depression? Why? I was like, well, let's take a look first at your food. There's an entire field in psychiatry called nutritional psychiatry, which is very mm -hmm. fascinating. And they just look at dietary habits because 80% of your serotonin receptors are in your gut. Mm. And antidepressants are serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which are meant to be acting oh, targeting the brain. But 80% of the receptors for serotonin are in the gut. 
So if you fix your food, you can actually, and this is, um, there's a paper that I came across a while back, something like 30% um, of moderate to severe depression, clinical depression I'm talking about here, uh, can be thrown, can be ameliorated into remission with nutritional changes alone. Hmm. You don't even need drugs. Yeah, thirty percent, and then another thirty percent can be ameliorated with exercise. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you combine the two. Usually, exactly. it's not additive. Exactly. It's usually more than additive. You can potentially just with dietary habits and uh, changes and exercise. 80% of depression can be kind of dealt with in that way. So, yeah, there is a, food is an important element of how you live, how you, your well-being, um, and it has a spiritual and a material dimension. Both of them are linked. We do not believe in this kind of dualism, this Cartesian dualism that you divide between. No, it's connected. Your exactly. source of food is going to impact mm -hmm. how you be with your Lord afterwards. And, you, you, you know, there's a famous story. I don't know if it's mentioned in the Qanun of Ibn Sina, but I know it, there there was once a man who came to uh, Ibn Sina saying, um, you know, I, uh, that I'm a cow. I'm a, it's, it's a very funny story. <laughs> a man once came to Ibn Sina and said that he was a cow uh, and he wanted Ibn Sina to slaughter him. And so <laughs> Ibn Sina knew that the man had some mental illness. And so he told him, he said, you know, lay down and I'm going to slaughter you. And so the man laid down and before he cut him, he said, he said, I want to make sure that when I eat, when, when I, when I eat you, that, you know, you have a lot of meat in you. And right now I see that you're very bony. And so the man says, okay, you know, I'm going to eat a bunch and then you can slaughter me. And so the man goes and he eats a lot. But by the time he came back to Ibn Sina, he was fine because he was starving. He was yeah. starving. Himself, right. And <laughs> so at, at university now during exam season, students are always on Adderall. They're eating, you know, pizza every single day. And that's why many of them have this mental health problems because of their diet. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Mashallah. So, um, yeah, I think, I think we've gotten the gist of this topic of prophetic medicine. Um, yep. And just, you know, in conclusion, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to be that this idea of prophetic medicine is something which emerged four centuries, you know, four, four centuries, you know, after Hijrah. It's something which it, at the initial onset, these were kind of just seen as hadith, soul hadiths, which later on, some scholars turned it into a whole science. Um, but that, but, but today, um, that, but I, I think that's the gist of it, right? That's the gist of it. And, um, uh, and even the scholars that turned it into a whole kind of writing books about it, mostly were hadith scholars. And this area was restricted to hadith kind of study and compilation. Um, but the practice of Islam, medicine and Muslim civilization um, did not depend on what is now called prophetic medicine. Okay. Barakallah yeah. Fikum. We always appreciate your time, Dr. Khilan. Barakallah Fikum. See that uh, pleasure is catching up again. Alhamdulillah, seeing you now, Zaytuna, and hope you're going well. And yeah. Inshallah. Inshallah. Jazakallah khair. If anybody is interested in joining Dr. Khilan's book club, Al Andalus, we'll put the link in the description below. Um, so Jazakum Allah khairan everybody Take care Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh